Why, <laughs> hello there. <laughs> My name is William Wilberforce, and today I'm going to be telling you the story of my life. In particular, my fight against the Atlantic slave trade. Uh, but before I get started, I must tell you what the slave trade was, and why I devoted my life to abolishing it. Oh, oh and <laughs> abolish is my big word for get rid of forever. Remember that word. I like saying it a lot. The Atlantic slave trade started around the 1500s, and it was a horrible journey that began in Britain. Boats would sail to Africa and brutally steal people from their homes to become slaves in the parts of America that Britain owned at the time. These people were once free people, living in their own country, minding their own business, and now they were being taken away from their families to become someone else's property for the rest of their lives. This also meant any children and grandchildren they had would be taken too. Everything was a mess. By British people stealing Africans, they were now seen as being property of Britain, but would never ever be considered British. The journey from Africa to America went across the Atlantic Ocean, giving it the name, the Atlantic Slave Trade. The journey took about two months, and it was not like the Caribbean cruises you all might go on today. <laughs> no. Life as a slave on one of these boats was not really a life at all. The Africans were forced to lie down, chained to one another, and able to sit up for the low ceilings or move from being so close together. One in every five of the slaves on board would die before they even reached America due to the terrible conditions on the boats. Now, if a slave survived the crossing and arrived in America, I'm sorry to say that life didn't get any better in fact, it got worse. Slaves were made to work for free on the land that the British owned, harvesting things like sugar and cotton that would later be taken back to Britain to be sold. Sometimes, captains of the ships heading back to Britain would even take the African slaves to sell for more money to rich British families. This horrible cycle continued from around 1560 to 1808. That's almost 250 years. I wish I could say British people were against it happening, but for a long time we weren't. The slave trade gave Britain lots of money and people were getting greedy. So greedy that they were ignoring how much they made the Africans suffer. Also, back then we didn't have BBC News to record what was going on inside the ships or in America, the bad people were able to present the trade as being something good for the country. But, like I said, the trade stopped in 1808, though not easily, I would know. It took years of campaigning and fighting to finally end it. Now. With the way Britain viewed black people in those days, it was never going to be a group of black people that fought against those in charge. This was because most Africans then were black, so British people often saw any black person as a slave and less important than them, just because of their skin colour. This terrible attitude towards black people made most white people not care about the suffering that was happening to the Africans. It needed to be white people who had a voice, a voice black people weren't given, who made this stand. Enter in I, William Wilberforce. I was born on the 24th of August, 1759, in an English city called Hull. My family was fairly well off growing up, and I went to boarding schools all throughout my childhood. 
I later became a student at the University of Cambridge, where I had a lot of fun. <laughs> Maybe a bit too much fun. I, I promise I did go to class, though. Most of the time. <clears throat> Despite my antics at university, when I graduated, I decided to run for becoming a member in the House of Commons. Now, the House of Commons is a group of people that get to make big political decisions for Britain, such as new laws. I somehow got voted in and started my political career at just 21. Not much older than some of you. I really liked politics, especially when I got to stand up and speak in front of everyone about what I was passionate about. Outside of the house, I still loved to party. I was even friends with the Prime Minister. This partying of mine stopped when I became a Christian in 1785, five years after starting my political career. I wondered for a while if I could truly commit my life to both Christianity and politics. Wouldn't I have to drop one? But I stayed in the church and in politics, which, as you will see, was the right decision. My newfound faith changed me in lots of ways, including a new interest in helping those who were suffering. And with the political power I had, I felt I could surely make a difference for good. I just needed to find my cause. My cousin and best friend, Henry, had been telling me about this new group of friends he had met in the neighbourhood of London. They had a dream of ending the Atlantic slave trade, which I thought was a crazy dream when he first told me. It was a dreadful thing that was happening, but ending it? I didn't think it was possible. The more Henry and I spoke, though, and the more research I did, I realised why he and his friends were so passionate. I knew so little about what was actually happening over there, and the more I found out, the angrier I got. How could we sit for a moment longer without doing something? So, I joined Henry and his friends, and on the 22nd of May, 1787, we began what was called the Abolishment Movement. Remember that word? Abolish? <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. We wanted to get rid of the slave trade forever. And so we began holding conferences around Britain about how bad the slave trade was and why it needed to end. We became friends with some slaves who had escaped when they were taken to Britain to be sold, and we would give them the chance to tell crowds what happened to them in America. They were awful, horrendous stories, but people needed to hear them so they could see why it all needed to stop. For some reason, I was seen as the face of the movement. I was the one with the political power, and as I said earlier, I liked speaking in front of people. After Christmas in 1787, the same year we started the movement, I told my colleagues at the House of Commons that I would be asking for a new law to end the slave trade very soon. It was safe to say they were not best pleased with me. Uh, I knew from the beginning this wasn't going to be easy, but I didn't think it would be another 20 years before I saw our dream come true. The 12th of May, 1789, my first major speech to the House of Commons about the need for the slave trade to be abolished. I tried to explain how horrible the whole thing was, how we were being blinded into thinking it was a normal thing to do, and made to think that black people really were less important than us. I admitted we were all guilty for letting it go on for 200 years without trying to stop it, me included. I told them they could choose to look the other way, to ignore everything I was saying about the vileness of the trade. But they could never say that they did not know and expect that to be a good enough excuse. 
my fellow members of the house did not like this, and they certainly let me know. Despite all the hatred thrown my way, I was finally allowed to make the first formal attempt at proposing this new law of ending the slave trade two years later in 1791. I lost by a mile. I suppose I thought that it could happen, but I was still extremely disappointed with the outcome. Remember what I said about people being greedy with the money Britain was making? It had stopped them from seeing what they were doing was so awful. There was no time to cry, though. I had to prepare for the next year and try to make my argument as convincing as possible. Years went by. I asked for the end of the slave trade 11 different years. And to be fair, each year I lost by less and less, but I was still losing. And each year that went by, I just wondered how many more Africans had been taken from their homes and their families and forced into slavery. It needed to stop. I didn't care if I lost friends. I, I couldn't rest until I knew that not another ship would leave my country to take part in that dreadful voyage. In 1807, 20 years after my first big speech to the house, I finally published a book I'd been working on about the slave trade. Don't worry, I won't expect you to read it. It's quite the length. Anyway, my book did quite well, and I started to notice a slight shift in the British public. They were beginning to realise that for the last 250 years, we were taking part in something that was stealing people, torturing people, killing people. We began getting more people fighting with us instead of against us. Tuesday, the 24th of February, 1807. Just another day in the House of Commons, where I was waiting to hear just how much I had lost by when asking for the abolishment of the slave trade. We were all waiting longer than usual for the results. I had gotten so used to sitting in my chair, waiting, trying not to get my hopes up. Then, at around four in the morning, the results were in. Britain was getting rid of the slave trade forever. <laughs> yes, we were abolishing it. <laughs> this time, we won by a mile. 283 against 16, to be precise. Parliament went crazy. I can barely hear myself think, but I assure you all, I would have only been thinking is this real? Is this really happening? <laughs> Henry was beside me when we heard the news. The shock on his face is something I will never forget. I turned to him and shouted over the whoops and cheers of everyone. Well, Henry, what shall we abolish next? We laughed and laughed, tears streaming down our faces with the utter joy of knowing what had been accomplished. My comment to Henry was not all a joke, though. Even though we had managed to abolish the slave trade in 1807, there were still slaves in the British parts of America, just no new ones being stolen and taken in. I wanted the current slaves set free forever. I wanted to abolish slavery itself. But I was getting old. I didn't have good health. I needed to recruit some younger folk to carry on fighting against slavery, while I supported them from the sidelines. So, in 1821, I passed my work on to a man named Thomas Fowl Buxton. He was great, and I trusted him to finish the fight to free the African slaves once and for all. In 1833, I made my last public speech against slavery. Thomas convinced me to do it, and it was never going to be said that William Wilberforce was silent while the slaves needed his help. A couple of months later, and just three days before I died, Britain did it. We abolished slavery. Every slave owned by Britain was going to be let go. <laughs> How's that for timing? 
I spent 46 years of my life fighting and fighting for the Africans who had been stolen, enslaved and abused by Britain. And just before I stopped fighting, I got to find out that they were going to be set free. Big, important laws like that can take a while to kick in. And so it wasn't until 1838 that it finally happened. On the 1st of August 1838, 800,000 slaves were set free by Britain. Free to start their own lives, lives that had been stolen from them for centuries. So, that's my story. And this is where I'll say goodbye. But you must go on and find out what happened next in the search for true equality for black people and what you can do to be part of it. The baton has been passed on to you now. It's time to fight the good fight. The fair fight. <laughs>